Well, good morning, everybody. Today is Palm Sunday. This would be the day that Jesus does his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. It's where, as he's coming in and he's doing what scriptures would say, he's riding in on a colt of a donkey. They're laying down palm leaves or their jackets as it walks in. They're celebrating Jesus for who they think he is, who they want him to be as he comes in to Jerusalem. And today we're going to be talking about how God doesn't give us necessarily what we want, but he gives us what we need. So I want us to take a moment to have a perspective for a second on how the Israelites might have been seeing Jesus as they started to accept that he might be the Messiah. So when you celebrate somebody coming in as a triumphant entry, and when they hear or remember or maybe have seen scriptures in the past that the Messiah is going to come to have this kingdom that will reign forever, and maybe in their understanding of what forever might mean is we are going to finally get that powerful king that is going to give us a kingdom back into its glory days, what it should be. And this should sound familiar because it's kind of like American politics sometimes. I don't, I don't want to get into that too much. But whenever we want to make certain things great again like they used to be, we forget that they weren't that great. And so <laughs> what I want to remember on this is when we look at the Israelites and what they were hoping for, because they knew what great kings looked like. King David was a great king for them. There was other great kings. They brought them into prominence. And they knew what it was like to be at the top. But usually after those great kings, what would happen? There would be another king that follows, and what would happen with those kings? The bottom would drop out because they were selfish and they wanted certain things for themselves. And the Israelites, from the very beginning, when they wanted the king, they wanted to be like other places. If we just had a king like so-and-so who's had, then we, the Canaanites had, the Hittites had, like they always wanted to be like somebody else. Then maybe we would just have the things that they had. We'd have this point. So God gave them Saul, right? And then Saul was really the king that God wanted. He just gave them what they wanted instead of what they needed. And then David comes in and brings them back up, and there's this up and down journey. And I wonder if they were thinking that this king, this Messiah that would come in would be the king that would no longer give them the roller coaster, but would give them the stability of being this powerhouse forever. And I think they were missing the point of why Jesus really came, the purpose and the point of a Messiah, and what it would really mean to be uh, coming to save and have a kingdom that reigns forever. Forever for me is beyond an earthly thing because what is one thing we all have in common here in this earth. We're all born and we all don't die. There's an expiration date uh, on everything, even Twinkies, believe it or not. I had an old one. I thought they didn't go bad. They go bad. They don't do that. They try it out. Everything has an expiration date. There is a time for things to end, but what Christ came to do was to give us something that would be forever. And to be an eternal thing. His kingdom would reign forever, but his purpose of coming here was to bring us the ability to be reconciled to the Father. Why Christ came was so that we could stand before the Father as blameless because we have that perfect atonement that would come for us. Now, Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians. So we're going to be spending our time today in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're just going to be hanging out in about five verses of Second Corinthians. So if you want to join me up here, I always recommend have your own Bible because it's just good to be reading along. Because then you can come back and say, hey, wait a second. Or that was a good one. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 16 to 21 says this. So we have stopped about I'm reading from the New Living Translation just because I like to keep you guessing. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. I just want you to look at this verse before we continue on and just to think about this. We used to think about God merely through human mindset. Not God, sorry. Jesus through a human mindset. 
our human brains can only fathom so many things in a way that makes sense for us. And when we think about Christ in certain ways, we limit him in the greatness of who he is. But now, when we really start to take a step back, we can see that when we've accepted Christ, our old self is gone. We can become new through him. That we now have a chance to be made new, away from our selfish, the, the selfish person that we have been, the sinful desires that we've had, being captive to the sin that God has tried to free us through, has finally come through a Messiah in Jesus Christ. And because of him, we now get to start to learn how that reconciliation process began. So then it says, and all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. I want us to see some things before we continue on about this whole purpose of Christ's coming, bringing us to be able to be at, at the foot of God, blameless and perfect as he is perfect. But it isn't just the end game. Part of him coming and us knowing that we are saved through him is, now what do you do with the life that you have while you are here? It says that he's given us the task also of reconciling people to him too. I start to think of through the sacrifice of Christ and what happens with him and as he it ascends to heaven, he gives this task to his disciples too. He has to leave so the Holy Spirit can come and dwell within them. And he gives them the task of making disciples of men, of going out and baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And don't worry about it. I will be with you. I will surely be with you until the end of the age. We had a very long discussion in class today about what does the end of time look like or be. If you want more on that, Mike has done all the research. He will tell you it was a good conversation this morning in class. What does the end of the age mean? But at this point, it's just at the end of this time, Christ is with you. He's on this journey. And I like to think about this in a sense of if my mindset is set on uh, heaven, the promise that Christ gives me through him, wouldn't it be awesome if I could start making it look like heaven here? What does that look like? What does that mean? If I'm reconciling people to Christ, how did Christ do that for me? He was a sacrifice for me. He did things for me that I don't know if anybody would do for anybody. He died for us. He took the blame for something that he didn't do. He hung on a cross for us. He was absent from his father that he has never been absent for, from ever so that we might be freed from death and have life in him. Now, if he can do all of that for me, what am I willing to do for those who are around me? Can I be a living sacrifice, holy and true, so that I can understand what God's will is through me? That is a form of worship. That's what it says in Romans. Am I able to go out and sacrifice for those who are around me that they may know who God is through Jesus? How do we start this process? Can I be forgiving for those who I feel like have done something that is unforgivable? Can I show mercy? Can I love some people who are really difficult to love? Can I be patient when it's so hard to be patient because people like to push my buttons? When someone comes to, uh, to slander my name, can I stand upright with integrity knowing that it's okay because I'm serving God? And I know what I'm doing is for him without retaliation. Can I do these things that others may know that I belong to God and I'm a, a disciple of Christ? <clears throat> can I do that? When we can't, when we've allowed ourselves to be made new in Christ through sacrifice, that I can change, that I can be different, not on my own, but because I have a Holy Spirit who is dwelling within me that all came from a sacrifice and a gift of Jesus Christ. The Messiah who wants his kingdom to reign forever has chosen us to be the temple of his Holy Spirit, to work and to dwell as we continue until he calls us home. It says, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So that we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. And we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. 
I went to the, uh, the weeds a little bit and was starting to look at uh, how the prophets, how God used the prophets throughout the Old Testament. And if you go through and you look at it, their primary objective in all of it was to get people to turn back to God. If you want to like simplify it down really narrowly, even the ones that didn't want to do it, like Jonah, his whole job was to go and tell them to repent. And you're like, I don't really want to do that because I don't think they deserve it. And he had to learn a lesson for himself. There's over and over again a call to come back to God. Now, it gets even more powerful for us when we say, come back to God because you've been forgiven already. Versus, come back to God and change a whole lot of things so that you can be made right. Learn how to do all these sacrifices. Learn how to do all these things that go according to our traditions so that you can figure it out. Christ comes and says, believe in me. When you believe in me and you understand who God is, you'll understand that you see him in me. That those who believe in me will not perish but have life. And he starts to show them the way through him to the Father and it's just come back to God. That we get to be ambassadors of a message that is so important. That the way in which you might be living your life is going the direction that God so desperately wants you to change and defy him through it. And sometimes it takes different roads for different people, but in every one of those roads, God, God puts a catalyst in there for change, and oftentimes it's you, or it's me, or it's you. It doesn't always happen by accident. God chooses his people to be his voice. We sang a song that will be that voice in the desert crying, prepare you the way for the Lord. We are the voice in this urban desert calling for people to find their way to the Lord. And that is our journey of reconciling others around us to make the same journey that we've understood when we've accepted Christ for us. And we don't have to make it a difficult thing. We can make it very simple. Tell your story. How'd you get there? How did God find you? Your witness is powerful. Your witness means something because people in your life probably have seen a change in you. He goes on to say this, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Sounds like such a different journey than what might have been expected when the triumphant entry comes. That triumphant entry of a Palm Sunday ends with Christ on the cross on Friday. How the tides have changed in six days. Five days, I guess. You come into town, people yelling Hosanna to the highest, praise the Lord, all these different things, only to put you on a cross later. Because they don't get the gravity of who you are, who you claim to be, and what was written that you didn't have to do for us. We have that promise. God made Christ who didn't sin to be an offering for our sin. So we can be made right with God. I always loved playing uh, uh, Monopoly when I was a kid. We always knew it was going to take like a week to finish a game. So uh, I would uh, uh, go to Jackie's house and spend the night. And be, Jeff, John, and I would be playing Monopoly. And we'd always leave it out because we knew we were never going to finish because it's a game that's rigged to never end, if you, especially if you don't play by the actual rules because everybody makes up their own rules. What I really loved about it is kind of like stowing away all these get out of jail free uh, uh, cards. So then whenever I would go, I'd always have this like, aha, no, I, I have this. But you know, it's even better when, like, you know you deserve something. It's not in the game. You deserve something. You deserve a punishment. You deserve uh, uh, all of the judgment that comes. But then you get there and there's a, hey, I got this one for you today. It's okay. Now go and change your ways. Don't do it again. And Jesus is there and waiting embrace us, to guide us, to see us as who we are and still accept us even as sinners into his presence and into his embrace because he knows who we are and what we are made and meant to do. What if we could see our brothers and sisters or even those who might be considered our, our foes, our enemies in that same light? I know that you were meant for something different. Or maybe how you're acting, there might be something deeper that's going on for you. I'd love to sit here and listen to you. Pray for you. 
I want to help you to see that you could be made right too, that you can be a new creation, created to do something different in the Lord. About 13 years ago now, I sat with a guy who uh, had a really rough life. He was abused as a kid, and he thought his own only way of showing love was to abuse, because that's what he knew. But as a young kid, his father abused him. As he grew up and got older, he abused people in his life and got into a lot of trouble because he did inappropriate things to one of his uh, children that led him into jail. And as he got out and, and was getting clean through AA and different groups, he found his way to a church. And a preacher got to him and sat with him. And as they were talking, he said, I, I want to be better, but I feel like I've done things that can never, ever be forgiven because they're just so bad. And as uh, this minister who I used to work with sat with him, he said, what if I could tell you that even knowing all of those things, you had been forgiven before you even did them, would have changed how you thought about yourself. And as the guy sat there crying in tears and wanted to know what he could do with that because he had never been told that he could ever be forgiven in his life because what he was done was so egregious, they sat, got baptized later that evening, and he started this journey of changing not only his life, but now going into groups of people who are struggling with the same thing and helping them find their way to knowing that they can be forgiven too. And it takes somebody to sit with somebody and say, I want to be the voice that God has for you. Even though you probably, in my mind, might not deserve it, God doesn't see you in the way that I can see you. But I can tell you that you can be forgiven. That you can be healed from the sin that has so plagued your life and you can change so that the next person that comes from you doesn't have to continue the chain of sin that you've been carrying in your life over and over again. There are some things that we've held on to that have led us to leave the sin that keeps going on to just say, well, I don't mean to do this. It's just part of me. Well, it can change. When we allow ourselves to know that we can be made right, with God through Jesus, and we can be made new. Not on our own, but through the grace and the gift of Jesus. We don't have to continue to pick up and carry the sins that weren't intended for us to carry. God has made you to be something so much more than what we've allowed ourselves to be in this world. When we allow God to work through us, to reconcile us to the Father, to accept that, the change can begin you will be made new. The people around you will start to see that you can be different and they can too. He changed a lot of people's lives. He brought a lot of people to Christ. And it would have been a person who many people would have been okay with if he just stayed in jail the rest of his life. But God changes hearts and God changes plans and God changes directions that can lead other people to him. And you can do that in you. And you're here for that reason to hear a message that might make you understand that the voice that you have is important and it's powerful. The witness that you have is important and it is powerful. The people that God has put around you need to hear that they too can be saved like you. We're saved. And your story might not be the same as the next person. And that's why we're made so unique because we can all reach a different person. Let them know how much God loves them like he loved you. Let's go to God. And Father, Lord, you're an amazing, awesome, wonderful, holy God. How you can see me as anything other than a disappointment is, a, is an amazing thing. You can see the heart through the pain and the struggle and know that there is still so much more inside of us to give because you created us to be good things, to be a masterpiece, to be your chosen children. God, I pray that you help us while we're living here on this earth and you give us another breath to breathe that we can help others turn back to you like you have helped us turn to you, God. And they, they may see how they are forgiven and that they can come back to the Father even though of the struggles they might have had in their lives or the hardships or trials or sin that has plagued them over and over again, God, that they can be made new too. They are loved that they are cherished. God, I pray that you help us as we walk this journey in life that others may see the glory of being your children too. And when we come before you thinking of 
what you might do in our lives because we want it. You have something even better because you gave us something that we need, which is an eternity with you and God. We're so grateful for the gifts of your son, Jesus, for the forgiveness that comes through his name, for all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. For outside of Christ, one know it needs to be a part of his family. Crying, preparing the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the cloud, shining like the sun.